welcome to our session. Uh, 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 I don't know whether people have come here to hear Carl or whether people are really interested in our title, which is a refocus on unconditional care as the basis of wraparound and other forms of care. Uh, I need that thing. Ara, there's another possibility. You love us. <laughs> or maybe you love us. Or maybe you don't. All right. Uh, so you don't care what we say as long as we are entertaining, right? right. Uh, and we can be that. Uh, okay. And we do it well. For those of you who uh, don't know, uh, I'm Ira Lurie. Uh, I uh, uh, worked at NIMH for uh, 20 years, the last seven of which was working uh, to begin the concepts of the system of care. Uh, on my right is uh, Carl Dennis, who, uh, if you ate lunch with us today, everybody knows. Uh, Carl was the uh, executive director of Kaleidoscope uh, for 20 some years. 27. For 27 years, uh, and is credited for being the father of wraparound services. Uh, yeah. And on my left is uh, Sue Smith. Uh, anybody who doesn't know Sue Smith from this audience ought to get to know her. Uh, Sue Smith was one of the first parents uh, who were involved in the system of care effort uh, and made sure uh, that us service people and us policy people uh, listened to parents. She didn't let us get away with not listening to parents. Uh, and she was one of the first parents to teach us that parents are teachers. Uh, so what, I, what we set up to talk about and what the PowerPoint is about uh, has to do with selling our book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recognize a lot of faces in here who bought books. Uh, so maybe we don't have a lot of selling job to do. For, the, for those of you online, uh, this is our book. Uh, it's, a, it's a second edition of our first book. Uh, it's a much better book because it's got more stories uh, from Carl in it. Uh, and it also changes our focus from being primarily around wraparound to being about unconditional care. And uh, uh, this comes somewhat from our uh, understanding uh, and worry about the fact that wraparound is very popular uh, and wraparound is very hard to do. Uh, and a lot of people began to say, we really couldn't be, do unconditional care uh, in wraparound. And maybe instead of saying our care should be unconditional, it should be persistent. Well, Carl especially, and he's convinced me, and probably Sue, uh, that persistence is not what we need when it comes to working with kids and their families. Uh, but we really need to be is unconditional. Uh, and that's and that's why this book is different than our first edition. In the first edition, unconditional care was a chapter. Uh, this book, unconditional care is the thing. Um, and we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about families and we're going to talk about uh, what we need to do to help families and um uh, and uh, we'll bring whatever wisdom that we have to you. Uh, it may not be enough, uh, but whatever we have, you're going to get. Uh, you want to say anything? So, do I want to say anything? <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> what we're watching is the evolution of care. And uh, I think for each of us, that view will be different because we've been different places in different ways and different times. We have seen our systems evolve. So I would say in order to determine where we're going, we really need to know where we've come from. And this is a look at where you've come from. The, the hours, the years, the ideology and the thoughts of a lot of people about how to serve our kids. 
And my observation is, Ira, that in some ways we've taken a step or two backwards. So today, more than ever, exactly. And I'm not selling the book. I get no cut of the Roy, if I'm kidding. <laughs> so um, the book is great. I like the first book. I like the second book. I like the stories. I like somebody who holds a vision and a light for where we can go and what's what's possible. So is that enough words, Ira? Yep, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. All right. The, the way we're going to start this out uh, is that... Uh, uh, ta -da, first slide. Uh, what is unconditional care? Uh, it didn't do it. All right. Uh, that's about the quality of our PowerPoint. So don't expect a whole lot of things that you're going <laughs> to that you're going to take notes from. Uh, you're lucky we have a PowerPoint. Uh, uh, what I've asked Carl to do uh, is uh, do his thing about talking about unconditional care and kaleidoscope and how it all got started uh, and what he thinks is so important about it. Is that a good introduction? That's fine. All right. So we can do it sitting down. We can walk around. We can do whatever. Okay, whatever you want to do. I'm, I'm That's with. up to you. Yeah, I thought it might be useful to talk about the the early days, you know, the good old days, as some people like basically to say. And the first thing I would like to say is you do not have to be a, a, a mental genius to do this kind of work. You know, what you have to do is be able to want to do it and be able to care uh, and try to take care of people. So normally I usually start by talking about when we first started uh kaleidoscope. But today, I think I want to talk about one of my stories that you probably have never heard. And that is the story of John Brown. Dr. John Brown was one of my heroes. He was one of my heroes. He's from Canada. And he was one of my heroes because in 1975, no one ever talked to me about a commitment to kids and families through unconditional care. Uh, it seemed like it wasn't that difficult to figure out. It seemed like what it required of you is to hang in there and basically keep going. And my story about John Brown um, is that John came to Kaleidoscope during the first months we were there. I had seen uh, and seen his name around, and I was looking forward. We were doing a staff development for uh, all our staff. And John walked in, and the first thing I said was, oh, my God, how am I going to get this guy out of here? He looked like Santa Claus, only a small one. With him was a woman six feet tall with a dog collar on, wearing uh, four-inch high heels and a complete leather suit on. And so I was really terrified of both of them because I did not want the staff to see this as the direction that we were going in. And so he was really pretty good, you know, and he told me first that when we were talking about one of the young people we were providing services to, that um, the kid would not accept the fact that his father was dead. And John said, no problem. Where's his father? I said, California. You got to remember in those days, uh, I had a nickel and the guy next to me had a dime. So that made us the richest people that were basically doing this at that time. And the kid's father in California, he said, well, take him to see his father's uh, grave. And the first thing that I said was, okay, do that. I can't get the money to do that. Uh, that's not going to work out. I started to talk to one of John's people who had come in and who said to me he didn't fly with John anymore. John had his own plane, he had his own pilot. So one day when they were going to do a presentation, John flew into some airport, the pilot that was driving his plane forgot to put the landing gear down and hit the ground and slid across. 
So I think with most people, you would say that's the last day that you will ever fly a plane with me in it. But what John did was take him into counseling and therapy to help him to remember to put the landing gear down. <laughs> so he, John continued to work with him for about a year and he continued to fly with him. And finally, he put another plane down and forgot to put the landing gear down. And that was his second one. So John uh, was gonna continue to counsel him. But one of the things that we can learn from this is you can't force people to do things that they shouldn't be doing or they can't do. You wanna help people to do those things that they wanna do and they're, and they're basically good at. And so that was the lesson that I learned first uh, uh, from John is to go out and to try and find those things that people need and people want. One of the uh, women that we worked with, when Olivia, who you met at Kleidoscope, that I went to visit her, uh, she lived in the Cabrini Green Housing Project, which is about 10 miles, about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes from here. And what she said uh, to me when I walked in, and we had a phrase that we always use, one of the people that uh, is no longer with us and ran all of our in-service would always walk in and say to someone, "Not don't trust me. You don't know me. You have no reason to trust me. Tell me what I can do to earn your trust. I said that to this woman and she said, only thing you can do is find me a husband. <laughs> And in none of the books that I had ever read did it talk about how to find a husband for someone. It did make me, because I wasn't married then, make me move to the side because I was not interested in being the one she was interested in of being her husband. So what I said to her, I said, okay, is that really what you want? And she said, yes. So we put a plan together. We sent out and got our nails done, and we got our hair done, and we sent her to a person to help her with her makeup. Um, I, got, I was able to get clothes donated from a good uh, store, and we got clothes for her. And we got all that done, and then we only had one thing to do. She wanted to meet some men. I said, well, there's two things you can do here. The first thing you can do you can go to the local bar, but that will not be the kind of man that you were looking for. So I said, why don't you go to church? I said, I'm not that particularly religious myself, but you ought to be able to find a nice man. And that's seeing where people are themselves and trying to put service together for them. So back in the uh, mid seventies, that's when we started. But before they did, I need to say uh, in remembrance to uh, Norman Smith, Sue's husband, who was my running buddy. Norman Smith was probably the smartest person that I had ever met. And it was very good to have smart people around me. It was so good that my kids had gotten to the point where when there was something I did not know the answer to, and this is not about social services, uh, I would call Norman. And then I got to the point where we cut out the middleman and you could talk to one of my children and they would say, yeah, dad, we know, call Norman. <laughs> and you and uh, and they would call Norman. So let me get back to the start of Kaleidoscope. 1975, April 1st, April Fool's Day of 1975 uh, was basically when we started. And what was important for us was to probably try to start something that uh, understood that people needed to be where they are and to work with them uh, where they are. And so four young men would get together and they would talk about what they needed. They all worked in institutions. They hated the institutions they worked in. And one night after drinking a little more beer than usual, they decided that maybe what they needed to do was to start an agent. And I always say this, just tell you how backward they were. They started the first 45 minutes naming the agency before they had come up with any, any services or anything that they would provide. And that's where the word kaleidoscope came from. Um, 
And then one of the young men said, you know, he said, one of the things that really bugs me is that we do this strange thing where we will take kids into the institution. Sometimes they don't do good and we force them into situations where they don't need to be. Uh, sometimes they do do good. And the reward for that is that we moved them to another place. And we thought about the fact that with most families, you don't move your kids along when they're doing, doing very good because what you're doing then is telling them not to do good and you'll be able to stay where you, where you are. So we need to be able to celebrate, excuse me, celebrate those uh, accomplishments uh, that they make. So that turned out to be uh, a service that we would provide Whoever came into our service, uh, then they could stay. And if we didn't have a service to meet their needs, then we would develop one specifically for that family and for that kid. And so that sounded pretty good. And then another young man said, you know, sometimes I look out the window and they're bringing kids and the kid has had this horrible background. Uh, and we make a decision immediately that we will not provide services for this child or for his family. He said, and you know, it seems to me that what we ought to be running is a service that is no decline. It says whoever is referred to us, uh, then we will provide services for them. And once again, if we don't have a service to meet their need, then it's up to us to design one specifically uh, for them. And so primarily with that in mind, we started the agency. And it was at a time when the state of Illinois here had started bringing back all of the young people that they had sent to out-of-state placements because that's what happens to kids who are considered to be difficult. Uh, kids would stand in corners and they would say things, hey, man, didn't I meet you at Brown in, in Texas? No, it was Excelsior in Colorado because we moved kids from one place to another. And so why would we move the place? Why would we move kids from one place to another? Wouldn't it make more sense for us just to change the place so it would meet their needs? And so we started to look at that. And one of the things that occurred to us then was we had this crazy thing that we call programs. Now, programs were where somebody was referred and they would have to fit in to what it is that we were doing. We weren't designing individually for them or for their family. They had to fit right in. So wouldn't it make more sense to individualize the services to fit that particular family uh, as opposed to having them move into something uh, that we had designed for them. So that was very, very important uh, for us to do. So those people who, who know me know that I hate the word program because program is always talking about this is what we do, whether it's treatment of foster care, whether it's group homes, whether it's institution. Uh, I don't think it's very good for families. And when we talk about wraparound, you just can't do it that way. You can't do it without individualizing the services. So of those services that uh, we started to develop, and we started developing a lot of in-home services were very important to us. There was a whole population of young people who were between the ages of 18 and 21. Um, we believed that it was too late to try to put them in foster care or to put them in group homes or to put them in uh, institutions. So for that group, we started designing individual plans for them to put them in their own apartment out in the community. We started, it was bad at first because we went to the universities and found a young person that we could pay to stay in that apartment with them. And what we learned was that every time we did that, the young person who we put in that house would wind up with all the blame for what went on. And so we decided, you know, well, maybe we just ought to put them in their own apartment and make it work from that. 
So we know that the real smart ones would always come to the office and tell us that they lost their money that we had given them to live on uh, and expected us to give them more money. And I would just nod my head up and down and said, that's really too bad. I'll tell you what I did when I lost my money. You know, uh, we can give you some powdered milk and some sugar, and we can give you some, some stuff to get some bread, and we can send you back home. And then when you get another check, uh, maybe you'll be able to hold on to that one a little better. So it's a natural consequences. People learn. Now, the best staff people uh, young people that I ever known were the people in those programs because they didn't know where the next dollar was coming from. Uh, so they was very careful about it. After we put them in that one program, or one, uh, excuse me, that one apartment by themselves. Today, I don't know how many are. Uh, at that particular point over the city of Chicago, uh, we had, oh, maybe 50, uh, 55 young people we had put in. And we decided that no matter how bizarre those young people were, if we put them in um, apartments around universities, we discovered very early on that no matter how bizarre they was, they didn't look any more bizarre than the freshman class at that particular university. So that worked very well. And it's about finding things to do basically for people. It led us on then to close the group homes because I can't, I don't believe you can individualize services in a in a group home. Uh, we learned that the hard way too. We had two group homes, and we had two young people in the same group home that had set fires. And I always went to sleep worried if they were teaching each other a better way to set fires at night. And it was not natural. It was not a natural family. So uh, we moved all those young people into what we were calling the untreatment foster care. And could we individualize that? Oh, yes. So if people said, well, this, this young person cannot stand uh, to be around uh, a lot of other people, then we could put him in a home where there was just a mom and a dad. Or right, if there was someone, a young person who needed to have other people uh, around them, then we would find a family and that family would have maybe three or four children of their own, put the young person into that home, and the environment for that particular ch child would be much better. Now, this was always the second or third option for us. The first option for us was always sending a young person home. And these young people who were coming back to us from all over the country, we discovered that even though the state of Illinois here uh, didn't know where their parents were, they all knew. Uh, they always knew where their families were. And we could go to those families and ask them, what do you need for this young person to come home? And we closed the group homes, moved the kids into treatment foster care. Now, I'm just going to try to tell two more stories. How are we doing time-wise? Hey, we're doing great. Oh, we're doing great. Okay. Nobody's nodding off. Seven, seven, Sue. <laughs> okay, so there's a hospital called Michael Reese Hospital that's not too far from uh, where we are. And at Michael Reese Hospital, they were the first to have a unit for young people who were HIV positive uh, or, or already had the AIDS virus and was going to die soon. And we had one of our young people in there. And that was Kathy's, one of Kathy's first kids. What was the year? Was that 90? Yeah, In 1990. And that was her first day on, on the job. And she was told to go find clothes for this young person who had just died. Who was, and I'm not going to spend the time getting into pretty much who Rudy was. But Rudy was in one of our foster homes because he had no family. And there was like five or six siblings, and they had one of them had killed their father, who used to trade the the whole family out uh, for our sex, but it made prostitutes out of his whole family. And Rudy was thirteen or fourteen years old when we found him, and that's basically what he did for a living. 
he had other places uh, and he would go out and he basically would sell himself. So I was at my Faris hospital and I was going to see Rudy and we had tried something a little different. We had decided that knowing that Rudy would probably survive that first thing in the hospital, we would bring him out, but we would get the foster parent that was to take care of him, uh, would go to two weeks that he was gonna still be in the hospital and start to spend time parenting him in the hospital. Rudy's first uh, approach to this person was to spit on her and tell her that I'm gonna give you AIDS. And the person who at one point with the Federation had won the Parent of the Year Award here, she said to him, just cause you died, don't mean you got to act bad. And, and you know, and I was standing there and I was saying, here's some realism as part of the process. So he went and he lived and he was the first one uh, we know of in the, in the state of Illinois that was diagnosed with AIDS. While I was at the hospital visiting him, though, I heard a voice and I recognized the voice. It was a teenage girl that we had had and I knew that laugh anywhere and I went in and she was in and she was in the process of dying uh, from AIDS as well. And I asked her, what can I do for you? And she said, just keep people away from me. I don't want them to know. She said, but you can go down there and take a look down the hallway and tell me what you see. Down the hallway, there was a room with cribs that were made out of metal. And all the cribs had an IV or something hanging from, from them. And all of the beds were filled with infants who had AIDS or were HIV. And there was no one to take care of them, to pull them out of that situation. So I went and you guys saw Olivia and I told Olivia and the rest of the staff, we are now going to start to provide services for infants with pediatric AIDS. And we started then what was to be the third uh, service for in, uh, for pediatric AIDS in the country. And we did the same thing with adolescent parents when we discovered there were young girls who were 16 and 17 and somebody always wanted to put them in a group home or institution, we would find foster parents for them uh, and we would move them in the home. If we couldn't find their families and we couldn't find anyone to take care of them, our goal was that if we couldn't find families, then we would do whatever we could to replicate families. You know? So that was basically the approach uh, that basically we used. Uh, and then I, I uh, discovered that this whole approach um, seemed to be working if we did one thing. We did things with a lot of humor. Humor helps to keep the stress, stress away and you're going to be stressed out if sometimes you wind up, or all the times you wind up, uh, waiting for people to be able to do things that you think they should do or things that they think uh, that, that uh, they should do. The PDSA service, we round up with 34 uh, young people, babies in that service. Uh, and we thought that we would be lucky if we were able to hold on to half of them, the rest of them would die. The humor was bizarre because we referred, referred, to, we referred to that as the 50-50 club because we were sure that only 50% of them were gonna make it. And we got that humor from a place that's not that far from here. It was the first uh, AIDS home in the city of Chicago and it was a big secret. You know, they didn't want anybody to know where it was. People were not very understanding about AIDS uh, in, those, in those days. And so they came and got us because they knew what we were doing and asked us if we wanted to visit. And we went and visited the home. And it was three stories. 
And that's where we got our humor from. Uh, one of the people had lived on the third floor and gotten sick. Uh, and they had come down because the bathroom was on the first floor. And it gone into the, the washroom and gotten sicker and could not walk. So they asked one of the guys on the first floor, could um, we take him into your room and just let him sit down for a while in there? And the guy said, of course, we'll put him on the bed. And they put the guy in the bed and the, cat, and the guy died. And the guy whose room it was said, said to me, Shit, it takes me two months to get somebody into my bed and they die on me. Because that was the humor of that, was that you needed to have humor working with that population. So we never ever, and I should have mentioned that when Olivia was at the table, never ever refused to, to serve anyone at any time. That no decline, no punitive discharge is the unconditional care that we provide. Later on in life, we started seeing people start to use the word, and I think Ira might have mentioned it, persistence, that we would do persistent care. And I call that a wraparound light because persistence is not unconditional care. <clears throat> uh, I provide unconditional care for uh, our children, and, on, and it's difficult, you know, if you got four kids, you got probably two or three that are good. The fourth one's an asshole. And so you have to learn how to deal with that as part of that particular problem uh, that it's going to be like that, you know. And so we had to teach people. So people would have not only children come in, and they were always convinced they were going to be able to provide help and provide service to them, and they would always have a smile on their face, and the kids would soon take them out. One of the young ladies that we put in this wonderful foster home had uh, a bed with a canopy over it and just beautiful linen and matching dress and everything. And the girl looked at the woman, she was 16, I think, they were, and looked at the woman and said, am I sleeping in here? She says, well, give me two months and I'll be sleeping with your husband and you'll be sleeping in this room here with the with all this stuff. So I got a call from that woman that afternoon suggesting to me that maybe this wasn't a good mix. And I said it was a perfect mix. Because uh, foster parents could not make decisions about who came into uh, their home as well. I couldn't pick my children. Why should you be able to pick yours? That was the approach basically uh, that we used. and. Oh, I, who's from North Carolina? Oh, right. And who's from Dakota? People in the people from the, oh, they're in the back. All right, I got one, I guess, I, that was the second story I wanted to tell, and that was, <laughs> that was Dakota. And this will give you some of the things that you can look at when you're trying to provide this kind of service. Um, I was invited to uh, North Dakota. We had, we believed sincerely that there was no young person that you couldn't provide services for, or no family that you couldn't provide services for. And in order to prove that, one of the things that we provided when we would visit people um, was for them to bring their most difficult situations, whether it was a family or a kid, and we would sit with them and we would put a plan together to make sure this person got service. The first time that we were in uh, North Dakota, and I remember it like it was yesterday, primarily because the next day was when Michael Jordan came back to the Bulls and I really had tickets to that game and Kathy and I wanted to go to that game. But this young man was getting kicked out of school and because he cursed everybody and he cursed all the time. And so as we were introduced to the people around the table, he had his grandfather with him. And his grandfather talked in a very thick accent and stuff. And when we took the break, uh, I asked his grandfather, do you know how to curse? 
in Polish. He was Polish. And he said, oh, yeah, I can curse in Polish. I said, would you be willing to teach the kid how to curse in Polish? And so if he cursed in Polish, they wouldn't have any idea what he was talking about. And I said that to the kid, and his chest stuck out this far because it gave him a chance to get over on the process. And that's the way, basically, we got him back in school. I understand now that he's a chef somewhere. You know, they don't always work out, but in some cases, they do. But if what you have to think about in that particular case is who is the family and how can you involve as many of the family involved in the process uh, as well. And it becomes easier that way. That's enough. Cool. You've been taking some notes. You want to? <laughs> I don't need notes for Carl's stories. I've been listening to him 30 years. <laughs> Did I tell him all right? You've been telling uh, him great. Hmm. Pretty accurately. Pretty okay. accurately. <laughs> Um, my observation is not profound. It's we meet people where they are, we try to provide what they need, and we listen to what they want. Not always the same thing, but what they want is always what rules. Because after years of doing this uh, work and following exactly these examples, um, it is simply doesn't work if the people receiving the services do not want what you have. And it's not your cookie cutter and it's not what you can get for a 15 minute therapy or, or service. It's an unconditional, unwavering commitment to deliver a meaningful product to the person that's getting it. And uh, people that work for you do not necessarily like that always some of the time. So that's all you got to say. Oh, she'll talk. She, she, has, she has more. I will believe well, you. You will hear more. You, you will okay. hear more. It's Iris' turn now. <laughs> I, I, oh my God, we're through, right? <laughs> uh, you know, when you, but this is what always strikes me, and you hear Sue talk, and you hear Carl talk and tell his stories, um, and. Carl is known as the father of wraparound. Uh, I think you used the word wraparound once, uh, but that's not what we were actually talking about. Uh, we were talking about unconditional care. We were talking about, what do we have on the thing up here? Care for people uh, we serve as we would care for our own children. Uh, we don't kick out our own children. We accept what we get when they're born. Three of them, not all four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Ira. That's all right. We we do this. We'll do this that way. All right. Um, and uh, um, I just want to talk about wrap around a little bit because uh, what Carl was doing at and developed at Kaleidoscope became known as wrap around. And I don't know, I, I, does everybody in here know what wraparound is? Uh, everybody done wraparound? Uh, everybody been trained with wraparound? Uh, let me just talk about wraparound for a few minutes. Uh, the name started in the Willie M program in North Carolina, North Carolina people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they had uh, a bunch of uh, 2,300 young people uh, who had uh, developmental disabilities, uh, mental, mental illness, uh, and assaultive behaviors. And they were not getting served. And the state of North Carolina uh, was sued uh, by some wonderful advocates. And out of this came a program of individualized care uh, that uh, uh, where they said we we're going to keep kids in the community by wrapping services around them uh, and not uh, uh, you know to keep it individualized so that uh, uh, people were getting what they needed and not what other people thought they what what yeah you know, what other people thought they needed um, and. Um, uh, that got called wraparound. 
Uh, and wraparound then became very popular uh, in the uh, middle eight, in the middle eighteen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know we're in the new, <laughs> a new century. No, you uh, jump one, you jump nineteen, jump, jump the whole century here. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the uh, in the late nineteen eighties, this is what really began to burgeon. Uh, it had been in in, in uh, kaleidoscope for ten years already. Uh, or more, uh, and it wasn't called wraparound, and all of a sudden it got called wraparound, uh, and it created uh, a way for people who are developing systems of care to provide a clinical service that was different than anything we had ever provided before. Uh, And uh, uh, it was really set up uh, uh, to... um, uh, to meet the needs and to have it so that it was uh, fairly, as much as you can take a individualized uh, unconditional care service and make it uh, have some structure. And uh, there were 10 original... Um, Williams. Uh, no, 10 original uh, uh, elements that oh. they put together and said, this, this, that this, that this was wraparound. And uh, uh, yeah, I began to understand that Carl didn't have 10 elements. He had one, it was in the, in, in unconditional. It was unconditional care. Uh, but in order to teach it, uh, they created a, pro- a process of, 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 of elements. Uh, the first time I heard Carl present uh, about wraparound was with John Vandenberg, uh, just outside of Detroit. Uh, and there were 10 elements of, uh, of uh, wraparound at that meeting that they talked about. The first one was never give up. The second one was never yeah. give up. The third one was never yeah. give up. You can guess what the others were. And that's what they were trading at the beginning of wraparound. All right. It, as things do, and people want to get clinical, people want to get structured, uh, states want to know what the heck you're doing. Uh, so wraparound got formalized into these, uh, into these 10 elements. Uh, the first one was unconditional care. And that made Carl happy. Uh, And then they said an individualized strength-based approach. So not only do you have to individualize services for people and not put them in cookie cutter services, but you gotta you gotta you gotta provide uh, uh, something that meets their specific needs. Um, And uh, if you're going to do that what they found in Kaleidoscope and what anybody who's really worked with kids and families know, that if you don't recognize the strengths of the kids and only focus on their weakness, and you don't understand the strengths in the families, and you only focus on on their weaknesses, you're never gonna make it. They're all gonna fail and you're gonna fail. Uh, So the individual strengths need to be looked at for the kids, and at the same time, family strengths need to be. We always called it in, in the, in the, at the beginning family focus. Uh, and I wanted families to come into our system of care thing. So I invited families to come so we would then have family focus. And they told me that I had no idea what family focus was. That us professionals had missed families all along. We disregarded them. We put them down. We said they were wrong. We said that they screwed up their children. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the most prominent uh, service that, that most people got was parent training. And I learned from the parents who taught me about what they needed. They said, you know, I learned an awful lot about how to take care of other people's children. Or sometimes I even said, my other children. The other three, 
but they taught me nothing about what to do with number four. Uh, it, that number four was impossible and nobody knew how to take care of number four. I didn't know as a parent how to take care of number four and nobody helped me with it. Uh, thus, what we found is what we needed were parents <laughs> who came and began to tell us what they really needed and what these individualized plans really need to be and what the support of family really need to be. And that's what this organization is all about now is family, is family support. Uh, uh, Carl talked about it, the kids need to be in their communities. Uh, they need to be in their families and in their communities. Uh, the next one was that care should be culturally competent. I thought I knew what cultural competence went, meant. And uh, I invited, uh, but I needed, a, I needed it formalized for the program I was running at NIMH. And I asked Carl and uh, uh, three other people uh, to come and tell us what cultural competence was. And there's a great chapter in here about cultural competence. Um, but what we learned is when we brought people in of various cultures uh, uh, with various backgrounds and various uh, uh, religions and, 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 ver and, and, and come from various races, uh, they told us we knew nothing about cultural competence. And so Carl and another and, and three other folks, Harry Cross, who was a Native American, Barbara Basram was from their educational system, uh, and Marissa Isaacs uh, was from mental health. It was the four of us that wrote. But we wrote it after sitting down in a room where about 16 or 17 other people always had an idea. One of the things that I learned early on was that if you talk too much, you'll be the one that winds up having to do the job. Uh, and the four of us talked a lot at that meeting and we wound up uh, doing the job. There's a, toward a cultural competence system of care, I think is the name of uh, the monograph that we wrote. And it was through Georgetown. I don't know yeah. where it is now, so you can still get a copy. Of that. And, and, you know, and we found out that uh, uh, the cultural competence wasn't anything that we understood. At least I, I did. And that, and that we really needed to look very differently at what we meant when we said that. Um, interagency collaboration was another one of the elements of wraparound. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, the care needed to be cost effective uh, and that it, we had to drive our process uh, both generally and focused on individuals and individual families uh, uh, as an outcome-driven process. Uh, and those were the things that we focused on and created as this thing for being wraparound. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, our first book, uh, somebody, is, when we were signing books, brought brought a first book. Was that was me. Oh, that was you who brought the first book. Right, but yeah. it was already signed yeah. by somebody, I don't know. Uh, and... Uh, uh, that's what our first book was all about. And, uh, uh, and Carl talked a, a, a little bit about the fact that they've changed unconditional care in wraparound to persistence. And, uh, uh, and um, uh, it struck me, and I convinced Carl that we needed to rewrite the book because we made unconditional chair, care, chapter six. That made no sense because mm -hmm. it all came from unconditional care. Uh, and without unconditional care, you can't do it. You can't do wraparound, you can't. All right. Uh, and uh, uh, so we decided that we would write, rewrite the book with a new focus saying, we're talking about unconditional care and oh yes, we have wraparound too. Wraparound is just one of the ways of producing unconditional care. I don't know what my next slide is. 
Where at the bottom, the mobility uh, of unconditional care? Oh, those are the things I just talked about on okay. the left. I thought you saw them, but I only saw them. Well, while you're looking for it, let me, you know, just suggest that one, one of the things that happened early on was that Ira had sent uh, Beth Stroll, who was then working at Georgetown, um, as with Ira, because she and Bob Freeman, Dr. Bob Freeman, they were writing a book on treatment foster care. And they came to Kaleidoscope. And we sat down and we suggested to them that they, Bob wasn't with them, just Beth, that you can't do this kind of work if you're just doing one delivery service. You can't say, I do treatment foster care and do wraparound because you won't be able to to do everyone you need to do that in that direction. You can't do in-home services without having an opportunity to move someone into something when needed. And so we started then to develop what is, because people like Ara, who are very, very good at finding the right titles, titles for things, started calling that a system of care. And for those of you who work in a system of care, you, uh, Ira is the one uh, that started that whole process, which gave, we would not have had a wraparound. We would not have had a lot of the services that we provide and services we help out with uh, without doing a number of services as part of that process. Do I know the truth? Yes. When they first came up, when Bob Friedman and Beth Stroll came up with the concept of a system of care, I said, no, no, we want a continuum of care. <laughs> and they said, no, no, you want a system of care. Uh, a, a continuum means just within mental health or uh, we need to include everybody. So I, it, it gave me, you gave me credit for that, but that was Bob and, well, you know, and Beth. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just add to that, that I think and still think that the thinking for those kind of things have to come from uh, three different places. It has to come from parents. It has to come from uh, policy makers, and it has to come from service delivery systems. You know, if you don't have any one of those three involved in the process, then you're probably lost already. You just don't know it. All right. So the the, the next slide here talks about why are we here today? Num uh, and this is slide number one of that. Uh, and you want to talk about the first one here? Because you've already talked I about it. So it's the undercutting of, of unconditional care as the, under, as the underpinning of wraparound, unconditional care versus persistence. Well, yeah, you know, I'll just say that um, I don't give up on my kids. And as I suggested earlier, uh, one of them, shaky about out of the four of them, but uh, you can't give up on children and you can't give up on families because usually the problem there is probably the person delivering the service, not the person receiving the services. And that's a lesson to be learned, you know. I hired a, uh, a guy who got great marks in school, got his PhD, um, came to Kaleidoscope, he lasted about a week because he could not relate to people at all. He wanted to tell everybody exactly how to do it, when to do it. Uh, and as a result, he couldn't get anybody uh, to participate with him. This is enough. Go ahead. That's enough. Um, anybody have any thoughts about that? In the audience, or you're far away, yes. Yeah, you, you, Kathy. <laughs> we have a question in it. it. says, I've heard the discussion on persistent versus unconditional care. What do you think is the difference in values and practice? What do you think of relentless? What do I think of relentless? I think we're close to gang territory here, and they use those kind of phrases a lot. Relentless. Well, we're almost in... A, uh, disciple territory. So yeah, the difference between unconditional care and resistance to me, resistance is an, it gives you an out. 
you know, unconditional care does it. You know, that you're going to be there and you have to stay there. And so that was true, as I said earlier, with all of our foster care systems. It got yeah. difficult in order to provide that. But what I had to say to them all the time was, tell me what you need and let's see what we can do about providing that. That, for me, was the key. Persistent <clears throat> gives you that out. You know, so that you can say, well, I'll just move this person along, you know, um, and that doesn't work for me. Does well, that do it, Lisa? Yeah, and and I think that that uh, that another issue that, that that you know that goes along with why are we here today is is this fact that you know when we started wraparound. Uh, we thought it was going to become the way of doing things. Uh, and what we found is uh, that wraparound today can be found uh, uh, in small programs around the country where there's still grant funding. Without grant funding, people are not taking it up as understanding that this is how we do things. See, not just one other thing, you know, and so... In every community out there, there are 10 or 12 young people who is uh, causing that state to almost go bankrupt. They are causing them thousands and thousands of dollars, mostly they keeping them in hospitals and institutions, and they're moving them all over the country. You can start wraparound in any state with those 10, 10 young people. And the reason that that works is because it saves money uh, to the state itself. But it hasn't happened. Well, it hasn't happened in move up, but people don't do the 10 children either. So that's part right. of the process. Well, that's true too. I would, I would add that our idea of the services remained the same. The actualization of the people putting the services into action do not always follow the wraparound that we hold dear. Um, we have a lot of things in Georgia that are called wraparound that you would have to look long and hard to find your values in. And the other thing, which I find quite funny that you haven't mentioned, is Carl always used to say it starts with collaboration, which is an unnatural act by unconsenting partners. So just, you know. Love that was work. always one of your favorites, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you made that one up. <laughs> no, I did. So, yeah, I did. I, it, and I believe that, you know, and that comes out of what well, we started talking about putting together teams and stuff. Uh, you'd have somebody from, for, uh, you had the parents and the family there. You'd have someone from child welfare. You'd have someone from mental health, someone there for education. If one of those people were missing, once again, you lost already and you don't know it because you need all three of those systems uh, in order to make the process um, work at all. So that's the sport, Kathy. Go ahead. Okay. Um, how do you get states to implement wraparound as you presented? And kind of like following what Sue said um, about not seeing the true wraparound like you guys came up with um, well if you that in states and getting the individualization if you are the person who is starting the service and every state and union is, is different and you know where you can go about which discipline is spending the most money in illinois child welfare spends most of the money mental health doesn't get very much so you want to run your services then um out of child welfare. If it's the state where it's mental health, that's where you want to run your money out of. Place like Guam, which was one of the few that we were aware of, they ran all their money out of, out of special education. So every young person might wind up having aid that was with them for four or five years. So it certainly uh, it, it was a different person, uh, approach, but always, if you take a look at the 10 hardest to serve young people, those are the people, and you try to figure out how much money you're spending on them. Can I just tell one quick? 
Okay. I'm going to stop so you. You're going to stop me again. <laughs> so, you know, we, we got, I got a call from Tennessee. I saw somebody out here from Tennessee once. And I got a call from Tennessee, and they had this young person that they were spending $140,000 a year on providing services to them. So I said, you know, can you pull the families together? Who are, the, you know, who, who's, who is the family for this young person? They say his, his father uh, comes every weekend and takes him home for the weekend. And I said, well, why doesn't his father take, the, take care of him all the time? They said, because his father has a job. I said, you find out how much his father makes See if he'd be willing to take another ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year and give all that money to him and save yourself forty or fifty thousand dollars a year on providing services. You know, it's of course they said no, we can't do that. We can't figure out basically how 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 to pull together. The bureaucracy <laughs> would not let them do it. Um, but those are the kind of things that that uh, that, that work for you. The young people that we had uh, here, when we would take them to the doctor's office um, here, you know, one of the things I love about doctors is the fact that they never on time. I'm an all on time kind of person. And it took one of these young kids who tended to go off a lot to the doctor's office. He'd go off in the, uh, in the waiting room. You'd go crazy trying to control them and trying to get it worked out. And so, what did we do, Kathy? We started our own clinic right in the office. And I got the uh, doctor from Osteopath Hospital, it was a teaching hospital. I said, can you come once a week and bring uh, your, your trainees and stuff with you and your nurses? So yeah, I could do that. So we ran the clinic then right out of the office with the idea that we would try to move uh, uh, the young people in the community hospitals uh, when we could. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, I, you know, I would just add to what you were saying and to say that one of the major problems we have is uh, silos and that our major funding agencies are in silos. And uh, there's a guy I met, I forget his name right now. Uh, I'm a little younger than Carl, but I still have memory <laughs> problems. Uh, uh, the guy was in Iowa. He was a, uh, he was a legislator. He was a, he was a psychologist who was a legislator. And uh, he created a concept where they would do joint funding. All right. Uh, every place that has done joint funding, whether it's in a small piece or a big piece, uh, has been successful at it. And he had this wonderful plan for the whole state of Iowa. And then the social service people said, well, we can't give you all our money. We have mandates in child abuse and neglect. You can't, you can't take our money from that because if, you if we put it in a pool, you might spend it on somebody else. And the mental health people said, we can't put our money in there. We got money to run our state hospitals. How are we going to give you money to do that? And we have community mental health centers that we got to pay and, and, and so on and so on. And so unless you can begin to break down those barriers and, and, and undercut that concept of silos, uh, and it's my money, my money, and to bring it down even further, uh, one of the things I've learned about state legislators uh, is uh, every agency uh, that I've ever known in uh, mental health and social services and juvenile justice, they each one own a local legislator who goes to bat for them and make sure that they don't lose that money and it doesn't go into a big fund. Uh, so we have it's a it's a matter of changing perception and matter of changing. Uh, uh, government idea about how you fund these services. Um, and on the other hand, unless you have categorical services, you don't get money. <laughs> you don't get money for what you need. 
Uh, I spent an early part of my career uh, dealing with child abuse and neglect. Uh, we big campaign, big federal campaigns I was involved with to get more money for child abuse. Well, then you then the child abuse people say, my wife's child, <laughs> that's where I met her in child abuse. Uh, not doing it. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, that, um, you know, uh, you don't want anybody to take that money because you see how big the problem is when you're doing it. And you can't conceive of having less money. Uh, even though when you get right down to it, if you give services to those families who are abusing their kids, they're usually not going to abuse their kids as much, if, a, if at all. So I want to tell you about something that happened to us. And I've actually never talked about this, but I think today it might be worth it. We were fortunate a uh, few years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago, that in the city of Atlanta, we were considered one region, Fulton County, city of Atlanta, with millions of people. And they had really all the trouble, all the things you've heard talked about here today. Um, and we had all kinds of kids. Well, really innovative, forward thinking, um, regional director, which that's our region, came to us and said, we want to have, Carl came and consulted to it, we want to build the best wraparound system there's ever been. They had this amazing pot of money that was supposed to be divided among all agencies. And the mandate was that we would have all agencies and all hospitals and all leading private providers on a network. And we could provide any time, anything, anytime, uh, instantly. And uh, it ran for, I'm going to say 12 years, more or less. And of course, things change and the government changed and said, oh, so um, they gave us enough money to to actually pay for the 200 most severe cases, if you will, in this in this geographic area. And so we had every service you talk about. We had instant care. Just an example, got a call from a mom one morning and uh, they were being uh, Talking, this is my son. This is what's happening. We need a hospital. And so um, she says, Oh, wait, I'm being evicted. I'll call you back in a little while. I was able to say, Let them put your stuff on the street, sit on it, call me back, give me an address. Within two hours, we had her stuff in storage, her in a hotel, and her son at a doctor. We had all of these agencies working together. And their mandate was they had to come or they did not get these millions of dollars. And, and these were for our hospitalized youth. That's where all of the people that actually ended up in the service were. And so we had middle of the night, our biggest public hospital. We give us absolute instant access, medication 24 hours a day. We had everything that you talk about or think about necessary. And we did this for 11 years with, I think, 17 partners, maybe more some of the time, four hospitals specialized, all everything. Just think of anything you could need. Apartment buildings waiting with rooms to, 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 for people to be in. And then one day, of course, the government changed. And uh, they decided that they wanted independent provider called core providers and that networks weren't allowed anymore. So with the money that we got for the 200 most severe kids and their families, we served, this was a capitated rate, we served over 600 families and youth every year with that money. So it can be done. It can be done. Not only can it be done, we know how to do it. And so do you. You know how to do it. It is the will of people to give up some of their power. And this, the miracle in this was we bid for unconditional wraparound money, the money to be able to pay people instantly for whatever happened to them. The county government came back to us, a small nonprofit run by parents, and said, no, we want you to run it. And it's like we had to sit down and think about this. This is a huge responsibility. Mandate for all the agencies. They didn't get paid unless they staffed. Every kid that came in every seven days, we took Thursday morning. We would sit until we heard every every kid referred to us. 
uh, the last to come on board was the school system, and they only came on board because they didn't want to ship their kids to expensive places and get in a lot of trouble and spend too much money, which wouldn't have been our money. It would have been their money. So eventually the schools came on board. And for 11 years, we made this work beautifully, as I said, until somebody somewhere decided core providers that had individual agencies doing all the services started doing it. And so it really didn't work because not all agencies are good at all things. And we didn't have the same partners that could make everything work. I've never actually talked about this before anybody, but it seems relevant today for where we are and the changes we hope to make. Every single thing we did was with Carl's consult. We built it with his consult. He visited. We had everybody, John Vandenberg, Ira came. Uh, Kathy that was on your board. Was part of the, that was part of the plan. So when the county decided who was doing what, we had to have a nine-month planning process with all the best thinkers in the United States to put this together. So today it seems relevant. Until this point in history, it never has. We know how to do this. A lot of people know how to do this. It's convincing your people wherever you are to do it. And I'm sorry because I really didn't feel it was actually. No, relevant. that's no, right that's at all. This is just what we. So just what, before we leave that, let, let me suggest something. In, in every community, you know, you can ask people if you can get all of the systems together. You can ask them, how many of you people know Walter Jones? Now, that's a fictitious name. And they will raise their hand from, from every system. And you can say to them, how much are you spending on Walter? How would you like to spend less? Bureaucrats always want to spend less than they're already spending. So if we pull this together, and that's what the thing with the 10 kids that, that that I think are important about starting, because the other part of it is, is what Sue was saying, that the people who are running these systems change. Now, I wouldn't have been here for 27 years with Kaleidoscope if I couldn't say to people when somebody knew, saying, well, you know, we don't know if we want to spend that money. And I said, that's fine. Why don't you just send me a list of the young people and the families you don't want us to serve, and we'll send you a list back of how much it's going to cost you uh, if we're not doing that. And and we are always able to stay. That's the beauty of making sure that your services are unconditional and you're working with the most difficult uh, to serve. Sorry. All right, and, and I'll finish that by, by telling you a little story of mine. Uh, in the Columbus, Ohio, uh, Hamilton County. No, I forget the name of the county. Um, anybody here from Ohio? Uh, uh, I went to visit them, and they wanted me to do. They had a thing called the Ten Kid Project, which was a wraparound project funded by a grant. And I went there uh, to do an assessment for them. So I looked at their program, and I went around and talked to different people. And one of the people I met there was the head of social services. He was a wonderful guy. He said to me, you know, this wraparound stuff is really great. He said, these people out there are doing the wonderful things with families. They're taking kids who would also otherwise be in institutions and keeping them in their families. This is wonderful stuff. He says, has only one problem I have as the head of social services. I have absolutely no control over what they're doing. <laughs> and as an administrator of a public agency, I'm a politician, I need to be in control. How do I, and he does it because he's a wonderful guy, but the next guy who came in, I don't know, I haven't been there in a few years, but I assume the next guy who came in and said, well, this is crazy, we can't do this. Huh? We can't do this, but but let me move on because we need to move on to the next piece, uh, which well, is. Well, just before you move on, I just yeah. want I just want to jump on Ira for for a little bit that I always have to remind people that I've known him for thirty years and I've known him when he was a bureaucrat working for the federal government 
He never gave me a dime at Kaleidoscope. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need it. <laughs> you, you were making do with the <laughs> with Chicago's wonderfulness. <laughs> All right. No, the, and, and I didn't. Yeah. He's right. I always tease him about it. All right. The, the next thing I want to talk about is this last bullet on the, I guess it's still up there. Uh, the ability of unconditional care, non wraparound approaches to reach wrapper down, wraparound fidelity. All right. In order to, to get wraparound funded uh, and to be so, so seen to be as a, what's the word? Uh, um, what? Evidence based practice. Mm -hmm. um, Carl likes practice-based evidence, which is what we believe in. Uh, but uh, we needed, people needed to have it be an evidence-based practice. They came up with something called the Wraparound Fidelity Index, which programs and, uh, and uh, uh, analysts and whatever uh, could rate who was really doing wraparound so we would know whether it worked or not. Because if somebody wasn't really doing it, to high fidelity, then then they shouldn't be counted in the numbers of, of whether things are good or not. Um, so let me tell you a story. I, I was hired by an, uh, by an organization in uh, Montana called AWARE. And we have two Montanans here, and Jeff Folsom, who worked with me in AWARE. Uh, Jeff and I uh, uh, were given the job of uh, bringing unconditional care to uh, uh, to this agency. Um, at its height, well, they had a thousand employees, Jeff, uh, all over the state of Montana. Uh, I did an assessment for the, for the state and they said the most prevalent and in most communities, the only child mental health service they had was case management. And we had case management all over Montana. So, we were charged with creating unconditional care for this huge aware. I mean, how many kids were we serving when we had a thousand? Uh... Four to five thousand. Yeah, uh, you can't do wraparound. You can't train a thousand people to do wraparound with all those elements. It's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. And the state not always wanting to help you. Uh, so we created what we called our Unconditional Care Commission. And with the Unconditional Care Commission, we brought in people from all around our agency at all levels. We had high level administrators, we had case managers, we had, uh, uh, we even had some uh, people who were working with facilities and things like that. Uh, we had the whole gamut and we brought them in and and created what we called unconditional care principles for AWARE. They were unlike anybody else's. They were based on some others. We brought in others from other agencies that I had worked with, um, and the wraparound principles were there. And uh, what we came up with a set of, of, um, of principles that were unique to AWARE, and the people who were working in AWARE and the population that we were working with. And it was fantastic. And then we brought in, we had a number of different service lines. We had case management, we had some foster care, we had group homes. Uh, we brought each of those groups in and asked them, we said, uh, how do you think your group could actualize these principles, these unconditional care principles? And they all came up with stuff. It was fascinating. It was a, it was, it was a wonderful process. And so what we did was began to train all of our employees, new employees, old employees, on these based on these principles. That was the basis of their training. And we did this for how many years? I don't know. Uh, for lots. That long. Lots of years. I think we started the, the unconditional care thing in about 2003 or something. Um, and uh, uh, it was a fascinating process. And so uh, Jeff Folsom, who's sitting over there, 
uh, who I keep looking at for answers, uh, uh, decided that what he would do is he would take our child case management service and apply what we were doing against the, on the, uh, the, the wraparound fidelity index. And what did he find? Donna? Without ever doing anything called wraparound. All right. We added something to it at one point, a thing called out of state placement staffing, commonly known as OOPS. Mm -hmm. All right. And the, and the, uh, uh, the, the purpose of OOPS was to make sure that we didn't send anybody out of state, anybody into residential care out of state. And we stopped doing that. But the thing that, that, that was about OOPS, that it, it was set up so that anybody who wanted any, any case manager or a, any case management unit uh, in aware across the state, if they wanted to send a kid out of state or into residential care, had to go through me. And we held staffings. And I said to myself at the beginning, boys, this is going to be terrible because I'm going to get on the phone with these people and I'm going to have to give them hell and tell them they're doing it all wrong and they shouldn't be doing this and they ought to be doing this and they ought to be doing that. It turned out that wasn't true. Every one of the oops calls that I got were our case managers needing help in convincing the other partners in the community that we should not send the kids away. That we were so successful in training people into unconditional care that they thought that's what they had to do. <laughs> and they did it. And I, what was our out-of-state Placement rate, almost nothing. Very small. Uh, some kids, you know, they get sent out by the juvenile justice guy. They get sent out by the school. Sometimes you just can't control everything that happens in your community. But we did a darn good job of moving it. Uh, aware is gone for the most part at this point in history. Is it resurging? All right. Well, that, that's good because we needs to be. We need it. We need awares, um, and uh, uh, but the aware folks were telling me about how hard it is to keep kids in the community now. Um, but but the lesson that I learned was, and this is what I teach now, is that you don't have to do wraparound. Wraparound is great if you have the capacity to do it, if you have the training to do it. And you have a system in which you work, which allows that in a community that's going to support it in one way or another. And communities don't support it. The federal government supports it. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you don't have to do it in order to make your service better and to make it more unconditional. Are we all totally unconditional every day? Are we all pure like kaleidoscope? <laughs> Um, but that is the uh, that is really the purpose why we're here today is uh, at least why I'm here is to convince you that yeah wraparound's great and wraparound's great when you can do it and you have the resources to do it but you don't need to 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 do wraparound in order to be more unconditionally cared. And if we get back to those unconditional care principles, uh, then we uh, then then we're going to provide better services for people. Uh, well, I have a second slide for why we are here. Uh, it has to do with selling a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, what 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 um, what I did for the book and what. Uh, uh, Carl and Kathy and uh, my wife Carol and Sue uh, 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 pushed me in and molded kind of some of the thoughts and and helped me refine them. Um, 
uh, that um, uh, we've taken the element, I'll, I'll read it because it makes sense. We have taken the element formerly called unconditional care and reimagined it as having three qualities that we feel define the essence of unconditional care. If you can do these things, you're probably providing unconditional care. Uh, the first thing is, uh, uh, we're no surprise to anybody, it's no reject, no eject. Back to the source. It's what Kaleidoscope did that made it famous and made Carl a hero. Right. Is uh, no reject, no eject. There were arrows. What? There were arrows, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes, there, always arrows. Um, uh, the second thing uh, we came up with was forming a helping bond. That in order to provide unconditional care, you not only have to take people in and not kick them out, uh, uh, you, have to, uh, you have to find a way to connect with them. Uh, there's a story in the book, it was in the old book too, about, we called her Cindy in the book. Um, and uh, I have to remind Carl who I'm talking about because he remembers the, the real names. Uh, uh, but but the concept within, uh, what was I going to say? Now I, I see I, I got myself off, off track here. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, what was I talking about? See we're, see, we're all old. What? Oh, a helping bond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I took a real risk when I wrote my part of that chapter. Uh, when I said that uh, uh, Cindy was Carl's friend. Now, for a psychiatrist, to say that kind of thing. I, I, they've never really given me a lot of a pat on the back from the psychiatry community. So, uh, but for a psychiatrist to say that, it, it, uh, you know, because uh, everybody talks about getting too close and boundaries and all that crap. Uh, uh, we really have to understand that if you don't have bond with people, especially people who are struggling and families that are struggling, you're never going to make it. It's not going to work. And you have to work at it. Yeah, you can have your boundaries. And you have different boundaries. And I am. And you have different boundaries. And you have different boundaries. But we all find our way to do the boundaries and, and keep them so that they don't get in people's way. Uh, and, of course, what the bottom line uh, is never giving up. Never give up, never give up, never give up. And I think we left something out. What was that? Uh, individualized services. Uh, I mean, it's one of the elements and the a whole chapter about that in the book. Uh, but unless you're doing an individual, truly individualized care of making sure that square people don't end up in round holes. And none of us are square and none of us are round. We're all unique shapes. And how do we create a service that fits the unique shape of not only the kid, but the family. So, the, so at lunchtime, you guys got the chance to meet Olivia. And uh, one of the things that when you do no decline, no punitive discharge services, is not a single thing, a single person working on. You need to always put a team together because you get different ideals and different approaches. One of the young people that was referred to um, to us at Kaleidoscope uh, was going to be difficult, we knew. And we all got to, uh, together. And the young person who ran our independent living services was there. And it seemed that the young man had put a knife into his stomach and ran a knife into his stomach three inches. And we were trying to figure out what we needed to do in order to provide service for him. And so Bob Devaney uh, 
who ran, as I said, the Independent Living Service, kept saying, how big was the knife? How big was the knife? And finally, you know, I, I turned Bob and I said, what the hell difference does it make? And Bob said that if the knife was six inches long and he only put three inches in, then we're going to have more to work with than if, we, if the knife was three inches long and he put the whole knife in the stomach. So part of it is trying to find those different ways to look at things that will help with the change. The other quickie too is, is that watch your language. Language is so, uh, is so important. You know, I had, to, I, w I had, a, I was on a committee at H Harvard. Kathy will tell you that I would come home. We would go every three months and do a weekend. I would come home with a headache. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And they were supposed to be talking about wraparound. And I didn't know what they were talking about, you know? And so we work with people who may not have had those backgrounds and those ex experiences. So it's really important that what we say to them, they understand. Meet, tell the magic wand story. Tell the magic wand story. Yeah. Okay. I don't well, remember. But you want you want I want to talk about the next book. The next book is going to be <laughs> We've heard no eject, no reject, forming a helping bond and never get up. And then there's the reality of my everyday life. How do we build that in 15 minute increments? Because <laughs> one of the new one of the new don't, no, it's serious. No, I do. I, how, I understand. How do we live the ideal? when we cannot access the federal funds that we need to make a lot of it work. I do not have the answer to this. I'm currently working with people who figure out how to build. For instance, in Georgia, we have peer services, which are the new magic wand, right? We'll see in 20 years how that works out. I, I, th I believe in it, but the implementation is some kind of shaky. But how do we build that? So our state has decided that we have limited access. We have limited providers that can actually hire the people we're training, not on the same subject, but absolutely on the same subject. And so if we have to figure out how we build it, when they limit the number of people who can hire the people we train, and then they build a need for them you put yourself in a dead end situation, which we're currently fighting. And in that end, I'm, I'm trying to become reasonably knowledgeable about how do you influence what you can get your Medicare departments to bill, to authorize billing. They can do that. They can authorize what you need. Uh, so that's the next book. Y'all going to live on. Out legitimate. Would, would, would I be pushing it, Jeff, if I said you guys figured out how to do the 15-minute thing and make make hay out of it? So you're writing the next book. Mm -hmm. See, that's what happens. <laughs> be careful what you say because you'll wind up with a job. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Kathy, before? The first state wraparound program was in Alaska. John Vandenberg ran the project. Uh, Carl and uh, Mel Breed from, uh, Kaleidoscope. from Kaleidoscope uh, were the people who helped them put it together. Uh, and they did just what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. uh, John Burchard from, and Sarah Burchard from the University of Vermont uh, were hired to do an evaluation of that process. And there's a book called One Book at a Time. I mean, One Kid at a Time, um, which is out of print, but but you can get copies of it from uh, the Innovations Institute, uh, which does most of the support stuff for the uh, uh, for the system of care now. Uh, they're out of the University of Connecticut. Um, uh, that uh, uh, demonstrates that point for point and show has graphs showing the amount of the decrease in the funding over time mm -hmm. that's fascinating I, I mean, it's it's true the the um we didn't talk much about um 
research at all and outcome driven stuff, do we? No. Well, you know, one of the things uh, for me is that I used to have researchers come to me at Kaleidoscope and ask if they couldn't do research on our services. Uh, and they said it would be a three year process uh, before we could get any information back. Man, and my response to that was, I'm not going to be doing the same thing three years from now that I'm doing now. So in terms of the agency itself, it's useless information. I need information now. I need information in the first three to six months. So you set up your outcome um, around that, those kind of situations, and you can really find out whether it's working or not, you know. But, you know, I wanted to say just one something about, did I say anything about language? I did, didn't I? Language? Yeah, did I? About language. I just want to caution everyone uh, that uh, it, it's one of the killers in the world when you got people sitting in front of you who don't have a, don't have, know exactly what it is that you're talking about in how it works. And part of the thing we seem to do in our business is if we take something simple, we'll make it as complicated as we can make it. You know, so I'm suggesting that if you do this, keep it simple. If you write any books, you know, uh, I always said that materials that we wrote, um, my mom and my grandmother would be able to understand stand it. And that's kind of a goal that you can have. Uh, not somebody in social services. We we uh, the last one working at at Harvard. I spent uh, some time trying to convince the people at Harvard who were doing a committee on community stuff to why don't you bring a parent in and have her or him be part of this process? And they said, well, we thought about it, but we didn't think we thought that the language that we would be using would be too difficult if we bought it a parent. Of course, my response to that was, why the hell don't you change the language and not the parent as part of that process? The, 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 the other thing that I was thinking about was the fact that you don't do anything by yourself. You know, you put a team together, but the other team that you put together are the people that you meet at this conference. You know, I, you know, I've learned so much from the parents that I've had a privilege uh, to work with. I've got people like Patty Durer, who's not here, or Dixie Jordan. These are people that if I needed to know anything about special education, I could call them up and they'd tell me what page the answer was on. You know, And so, those, so use those people. Use Sue. Sue, I'm going to give you another job. Call Sue. Get a phone number, call up, ask the questions. Remember, Carl's retired. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you know what that means, right? Call. Bye. <laughs> you're, you're not busy. Call. Okay. So we got 15 minutes left, and we can probably ask does somebody have a question? Yes, sir. More dependent than on institutions and residential programs. Or no services at all. Yeah. So here's an answer for you. Uh, it was a small community uh, in Western um, Iowa that came to a conference and sat down to, to talk. And we talked, and they said, We don't know if we're doing wraparound. Uh, or, and then, but we weren't using unconditional care there. And I said, Well, you know, what are you doing? He said, If we find a young person, or a family that has contact with most of the systems in the in in our community, then we go up to the school one evening and we sit down and we put a plan together. And we sometimes we put in services, sometimes, but very seldom do we have to put in money. We get hung up on money a lot as opposed to services. I worked in New Zealand, um, was was they would go and get cars for people. Uh, they would do all kinds of things like that, you know, because they thought about that was a direction to go in. 
you know, and you could get that done. Of course, you also needed to know enough to tell them, if you give me a car, you can write it off your income tax, and I don't care how much you put on there for that. You know, so you, you learn those kind of kind of things. But the main point of it is, it, it, and I used to, to uh, say, you know, when people would say, uh, work outside the box, you know, I used to say, tear up the box and throw it away and start from scratch. Is that too much? Uh, no, it's not too much at all. And 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 I want to go to a, a, take a little different tack on that. Um, one of the things I've learned, I, you know, uh, as I stopped being a national consultant and I stopped doing a lot of uh, traveling around, uh, doing that kind of stuff, I started doing more clinical work. And I work in a I work in a mental health clinic now, child mental health clinic. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I've gotten to meet a lot of families who go to mental health clinics, and they have unbelievable amounts of need. And the fact that they keep going to me is just unbelievable. I I, I think I'd fall apart if I had all their worries. And one of the things that you and 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 uh, and John used to do in your training uh, was focus on life domains. You don't always focus on the kid and their behavior and what's going on and pathology and all that stuff. Uh, you 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 would go in and a wraparound and start looking at the whole family. And the various life domains, what is their living like? What is their work life? Uh, what is the mental health of a parent like? What is it, you know, what are the school issues? What are they, um, and, and if you begin to approach families with that, there's a chapter in here written mostly by uh, Kathy Dennis mm -hmm. uh, about looking at life domains. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you do that, then you begin to get a much better feeling about what you're doing for people, how much need they have, and where they and where we can help them. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course they're going to get dependent on us because they have so many needs. Right. Uh, you know, uh, good. That's what that's what we're there for. It, it, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it was also very important to start out talking about people's stress. You know what? What does mom? Uh, do what are are her strengths? Well, she's a great cook. Good, you know. And so we would go through those things. And how can we make that part of the process? Uh, and and how how why sit around putting a plan together with a bunch of people? And the father um, did, did not read or write, you know. And so he wasn't saying anything. And so finally, I was able to get him. When I asked him, what's your favorite thing to do? You know, he said, I love to fish. I said, well, do you take the kid fishing with you? He said, no. I said, that would be great. I said, I'm going to be here till Thursday. I'll go fishing with you. So you could see him grow right in front of your face and start to participate in what we were doing and what we were talking about. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kat. And part of that plan, you need to uh, timeline and uh, those things, and that should be what you're talking about every time you have another or the next meeting, you know. And if you, you know, if you work with people, focus on their strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you'll find over time that they'll become much less needy mm -hmm. uh, if you recognize their strengths and help them recognize their strengths. Uh, we, okay, we were together uh, in um, California. Uh, and the same issue came up with making people dependent upon you and your services. And we had brought in all of the people from the systems, but the agency was Eastfield Minquam, is that the name of it? Yeah. Um, and Ira and I would sit down and we were going to see if we couldn't help them through part of that, uh, that process. And before we could do much, uh, this guy stood up 
And we asked him, you know, how did you feel about the services you and your family was receiving? What he said was, I used to come home from work. He says, and I'd take my pants off and I'd sit in the living room in my shorts and uh, I'd get me a beer and I'd drink a beer. But, you know, I can't do that anymore because we got all of you people coming in and going. And as soon as I don't need you anymore, I'm going to get rid of you. You know, so families do not like a lot of people running over them. Is that true? That's true. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, an observation from the years of both receiving services and, and providing services is most people want to do what they can do for themselves. We had this lady and we sent one of our best people to her house and it was sad, kind of rural really run down, really not okay. And so talked to mom a bit and came back, our worker, who you guys know, came back with a list of 15 things that mom needed. And so she went back and she told mom and the woman just sat there looking and she said, no, I need my car fixed so right. I can work and pay for the things I've always paid for. <laughs> we fixed the car, she did it all herself. The rest of it was done. So, I mean, what we saw was not her need. Her need was to be able to help her own family. But yeah. we did, and, and that, you guys know this person. It was so profound because it was things like an exterminator in food and, right. you know, all kinds of things that were really needed. And in her mind, she was only asking to have her car fixed. So we need to be really, really, really aware of how invasive we are in people's mm -hmm. lives and what they want us to do, what they think will help. Well said. Yeah. All right, our time is up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming and staying. You're a great audience. Bye.